This is unfragmented, inspired by Colossians. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Join our book club as we pursue a more consistent Christian life. All right, welcome to Unfragmented again, where Lee Bortons and I and our participants explore the cohesion of things believed with the cohesion of things done. So thought leads to action. Do we have the proper thought? That's Christian thought. Today is Thursday, April 20th, 2023. I'm Kevin Novak, and Lee Bortons is our co-host. And this month, we're still talking about Henry Hazlitt's book, Economics in One Lesson. It's really good. So we got a good start on it last week. And we'll be discussing Mr. Hazlitt's book the rest of April. So that's this week and then next week. And then starting in May, can't believe May is already just a couple of weeks away, we will be discussing Samuel Blumenfeld's book, Is Public Education Necessary? I have read that book before. I look forward to reading it again, and I just hope that everyone here is learning just as much as I am. So, um, Lee, I'll turn it over to you if you want to get us rolling here on um, some of the things that we talked about last week and then have some good discussion this week. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. Um, all the, the bad words I just said apparently didn't get recorded. <laughs> so anyway, we are going to, as a way of review, uh, go over a couple of terms from last week. And then I want to actually read out loud that what is the one lesson? Um, and maybe I actually should start there to give you guys time. Um, there is a PDF that floated around last week. If any of you have that, you might want to pull it up. If this you don't is have and if you go to it's the end of chapter one section one can you guys still hear me mm -hmm. okay the art of economics consists in looking not merely at the immediate but at the longer effects of any act or policy it consists in tracing the consequences of that policy not merely for one group but for all groups and so what the rest of the book does, that's part one, part two, each chapter discusses a different situation where uh, looking ahead to how it affects other groups is often overlooked. And so what I thought would be really good to, for next week, if you want to prepare for this, is to um, come up with examples that are going on right now where policies are being made where they're only catering to a special interest or an immediate need, or they're not looking at the long-term consequences. And let's, if we, there's five or six of us on, if we could each discuss one, that would be just really, uh, I think a robust conversation and a good way to end the ideas that we've been talking about. So saying that, I gotta pull my list here. So one thing that um, he talks, Hazlitt talks about is this idea of zero sum that a gain for one means a loss for another. I want to talk more about that in detail because I think some ways he positions that he's correct and other ways when he positions that he's not. And I want to hear what you guys think about that. So the idea of zero sum um, and what in the world is fiat money? I think it would be good to go over the de definition of that in a moment. So I'm reading these to give you some time to jot them down and think about it. Um, and he's got this idea called a special pleading. It's an attempt to exempt oneself from a set of criteria that, that you expect to be applied to other people and circumstances. So if you could take a moment to think about what is meant by zero sum, what is meant by fiat money, and what is meant by a special pleading, which we didn't, I don't know, Kevin, remind me, did we actually talk about that last week or was just in the reading at that point? It was just in the reading it was in the first paragraph of chapter one, um, starting with economics is haunted. So he makes a big deal about the special pleading, but we have not yet talked about it. Yeah. So um, while the rest of us think about the fiat money and the zero sum, why don't you tell us 
I mean, special pleading, that must be right up your alley. You're a prosecutor. You probably hear special pleading all the time. Well, I actually, I do, usually through the defense attorneys. As much as I'd like to hear it directly from the defendants themselves, I don't get that opportunity that often. But um, I, I was looking up examples, actually, and I think the best one that I came up with or that I discovered, the simplest one is, say, a student is caught cheating, and he says, well, I know that cheating is wrong, but here's why I should get away with it. And it's essentially um, trying to get out of what the actual uh, rules are as in a, in, in getting an exception to what the rule should be. So I suppose in a policy environment, it might be, well, you can raise taxes on everyone else, but our industry or our company or, or, or some other sliver of that should have lower taxation without being able to actually justify why. So if the student's caught cheating, but wants a pass on that, but they can't give an explanation as to why, that would be a special pleading. Mm -hmm. Okay, Timothy had a good example. You want to explain it? Yeah, when when Congress passed the Affordable Care Act back under President Obama, uh, they put in place all sorts of rules for all the employers in America uh, that that all the employers had to follow, except that they left a loophole for themselves so that they didn't have to follow those rules in uh, in, in their own congressional offices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think Hazlitt uh, touches on this, but maybe not as much as, say, Gary North or maybe Kerry Morgan would in his books. But there's an immorality to that. There's an evil and a corruption associated with that. And the place where it's really difficult is uh, like if you look at my LeeBortons.com site where it says, I have to read it, I still haven't memorized it. Of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. It's really difficult when someone's saying, but you know, we, we need this exception because it's for kids, or we need this exception because it's for the mentally ill, or we need this exception for, you know, it's some situation that pulls at your heartstrings rather than paying attention to the morality of what happens when somebody's using somebody else's money for these wonderful things. So. Any other thoughts or comments? I think the unions during that um, Affordable Care Act also got special um, carve outs in that mm -hmm. where they weren't having to follow the guidelines um, that everybody else was having to follow. And um, I, my husband is a union worker and believe me, we benefited from it, but I was just, uh, I thought it was horrible. You know, if it's good enough for everybody else, then the union should have taken the deal too. I mean, it was gonna affect me, but uh, the, the moral portion of it was the fact that, you know, they're, hands are in the pockets of the politicians who are writing the law and i just there are people that really do need affordable health care and it just um but let's know, take it away by making so many rules doctors can't make it affordable anymore right yeah yeah that's why so much of the, the there aren't private practices anymore really that, that's all going by the wayside. All the hospitals and everything are just absorbing all of these physicians um, into their corporations. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do have a private doctor, you're paying a lot of money for that private doctor because they're not going to follow. Um, they're not going to mess with the insurance companies. It's mm -hmm. going to be cash only or concierge membership type of situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, that's a good example. Yeah, but you know, so, so what ends up happening is because they, a lot of times, because the legislators can't figure out a way to legislate, because you can only legislate what not to do. You can never legislate the thing to do. And so once you know the rules, entrepreneurs always find a way around them. And so those concierge doctors or homeschoolers or whatever it is, 
they find ways to say, not only do we not want the special exemptions, we're not going to plead for anything, we just want to be left alone. And that's not really well understood by most of the populace, because why would you not want free things? Because you get shackled, <laughs> to, qu right. to quote you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, um, the fiat money, does everyone here have a good understanding of what fiat money is? Because we don't need to talk about that then, if you've all got that down. So Julie, are you nodding? I'm trying to see you all here. You got it, what it is? Okay. I do, yes. So was there something you wanted to say about that, Kevin, when you were making the list, or was it just a good thing to remind us of? No, I think it was just something that I think at the end of last week we had talked about just to make sure everyone understood mm -hmm. where we're going with that. Because obviously it's talked about later, just like um, I think George Gilder talked about it, but, I, but here it's talked about in a later chapter as inflation uh, being a tax. So that, mm -hmm. that's good to know. As long as someone has a good understanding of fiat money, they know that inflation is a tax on people. Yeah, yes. And so the thing that it's really ruined some of the arguments for us um, in that uh, you could say, you know, there's not enough money for this or it comes out of the taxpayers pockets or things like that. And they were, and some people say, no, it doesn't. They just print it. And then they hope the economy catches up and it doesn't always catch up. And eventually it doesn't catch up at all. So fiat money just allows somebody to make the rules instead of the actual consumer face-to-face. -face. Julie and I really like it when we can work together on something without somebody else telling us how to do it, right? Yes, that is right. That's right. Okay, so then the last one was zero sum. And I say that for last because I don't know that I quite agree all the time with his definitions and examples. So Kevin, you want to go over what zero sum means and why you put that on the list and give me a second to find some quotes he has that I think aren't quite, or what I, I don't agree with. So let's figure out why I don't. Right, I think it's similar to opportunity cost, but I, I don't remember what page it was on, but I remember at the end of last week's club meeting, we talked about the example, oh, here it is on page 33, at least in the hard copy, we had talked about um, the civil authorities taking $10 million away from the taxpayers and then building a bridge. And I think I had used the term uh, zero sum. Of course, we're, we're in an environment where they're just not printing money uh, unilaterally, where there's a, a fixed amount of money. I think I used the term zero sum and saying, well, there's only a finite amount of money to go around. So it's being taken from this group, the taxpayers, and being given to this group over here, the people making the bridge. And so I use that term to say, well, now the people, the taxpayers, they don't have that money in order to be able to create wealth and to do other things. Now people are just stuck with a bridge they may or may not use. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I think that example holds for your definition of zero sum, because it's somebody else making the decision. But I think George Gilder in our conversation we had before would say, but the thing is, there's never a zero sum game if you let the free market do its job, right? It's when authorities who have no um, skin in the game make the decisions that that bridge example mm. works. Because if, if entrepreneurs are allowed to do it, they'll figure out how to pay for the bridge and the thing that the bridge's money sucked up. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? I, you know, I, I, didn't think, I didn't think of that qualification, but I do like that. I think I'm going to add that from now on. I, I think it was in Alaska that had that bridge to nowhere. Mm -hmm. Is that, does everyone remember that? Yeah. And it was mm -hmm. like, well, the, the free market wouldn't have put a bridge there. It was some special, it was probably a congressman or woman or senator uh, representative that said, hey, you know, if I'm going to vote for this, then you need to throw some money my way and we'll build this bridge. And the free market would not have put a bridge there. So I, I do like that qualification, Lee. That's like the, uh, the bullet train from San Francisco to LA, right? That <laughs> is totally un, unfeasible economically, but the government is trying and trying and trying to build it. So yeah, they're still trying. <laughs> yeah. 
So, so one of the arguments is, besides it supposedly being an economic benefit when it's built, uh, Hazlitt holds up this idea of people, it's a fallacy when people say it will make jobs. What's the fallacy? And so don't you certainly see more jobs being made? Hmm. It takes away other jobs, is what he was Which saying. you can't see. Right. Yeah. And once again, yeah, and I think it. I, okay. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Lee. Sorry. I will say, well, and once again, if it wasn't somebody who was spending somebody else's money making the decision, I would say probably both things could happen. You could, um, you know, build that. What's the example we're using? Not the bridge. We moved on to another one. Bullet train. The bullet train. The bullet train. Yeah. You could probably, if it was up to entrepreneurs, you could probably build the bullet chain train and get jobs um, for people, as well as even more jobs for the people that are going to service the bullet train and the people around it, right? So that's always the free market economic argument for um, disruptions in the economy. Yes, the current people may lose their jobs because there's a new industry being created, but new industries generally provide a lot more jobs. And so it's a complicated issue and having a senator just being, you know, vote for me because now Goldsboro County has this many new jobs because I got the government money to pay for it. That's what Hazlitt's talking about. Yeah, I think if the free market was building the bullet train, they would then be thinking about, well, uh, how is it that we can um, increase business here, there, you know, they're going to be always forward thinking about the advantages of that bullet train instead of, okay, this is just something that um, we want to create jobs and that's all they're thinking about is a bullet train. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think that's the other difference too. The entrepreneur is always thinking of something else that they can do to better what it is that their, that, that original plan is. So how does sin fall into that? Because we can certainly make it sound like it's utopia when entrepreneurs are in charge. Well, greed, and, greed. Greed. Yeah, greed, <laughs> greed and fraud are both real. Um, uh -huh. You know, and especially like you said earlier, Lee, where there's rules and loopholes, there will always be people who will find the ways to either take advantage legitimately or to exploit illegitimately those same loopholes. Well, and it's this idea too, I think we have a culture that is, um, has this idea or this presupposition that everyone's a winner, you know, like everyone gets the trophy, everyone. And in business or in the free market, sometimes losing is the best thing that can happen to a, a a, a company or a person, you know, be, I mean, yeah, it just, it, it's not the right idea. It's not serving a need like you thought it would. Um, so this perpetual, there has to be, you know, when you think of the bullet train and, um, and I know nothing about it, but, you know, I'm sure, you know, pumping money and money and into this thing and force feeding it to work, because they want control over it, you know, it's probably going to be some sort of government thing. Uh, we also kind of, on the flip side, we saw this play out in COVID where the government got to decide who was essential and they determined it was the big box people because it makes more sense to put all people in one big box instead of our individual <laughs> little family run, you know, that can serve the families locally. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a tricky, when you start thinking, it's just, it's a tricky thing. Um, so, so what are people's responsibility? Because one thing that's, that's difficult for me is that I know the majority of people get up every day and just hope to go to bed in a clean house and have fed their children. They don't have the bandwidth or the energy to consider what they can't see, the unseen. Do they have a responsibility or is it our senators and our leaders and our corporate people who have that ability? Is it all on them? Like, how do we work this out as a society? Well, I think if well, you're talking think... about current times, I think you have to start listening to people again. 
if 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 some of this stuff is a legislative thing, um, I, I think a lot of us really feel like we're not being heard. And mm -hmm. how do you get that legislator mm -hmm. to start hearing you instead of just hearing um, their the, the the people who put the poifers in their reelection campaign? Mm -hmm. Or the masses who will vote for them and just want things given to them. Yeah. Tim, well, you want right. to say something? The informed citizenry, right? The educated mm -hmm. democracy is the answer, is to have the people who, who cast the votes, the people who go and talk to the legislators be informed to know that it's not just what can the legislator put in my pocket, but how can the legislators deal rightly with all the people I I think all that's true. I think I would have made the point Timothy made in that I would have made it in a different way in that younger people, well, and even people my age, where we haven't necessarily been taught to think in a in a in a Christian worldview. A lot of it is. Uh, personal morality, pietism, you know, how is Jesus personal to me? And I think for many, many years, theologically, we've suffered from talking to gen the generations about how they can be influential culturally and politically. I think, I think Lee, you had made the, uh, a comment last week about how we need Christians in the civil authority, in the civil government so that we can do the right thing. But they don't necessarily want to be there. Those are my words, not yours. But um, so I think we're getting a lot of that back from what I've seen. You know, now we're getting more and more engagement. But to me, that would be an informed citizenry where we're teaching our younger people and people like me are beginning to learn more about economics and finance and politics. And we can see like what the civil government is doing wrong, what they're doing right, instead of just deferring to them that like they're these experts. For many years, we've deferred to them like they're these experts just like the academia are experts, but they're not. They're, they should mm -hmm. be us, and we, we should be able to check them that way through our knowledge of Christianity. Or you could start a business that would inform millions of children in the classical model <laughs> and practice. Um, no, I was going to say having young adults um, of my own who you know, they all had a mix in their involvement. They did the team pact thing and I made sure they knew how to be a good citizen and to vote. Um, but, you know, different seasons of life. I remember Lauren was in the midst of losing a child in her belly and she was having to stand in line and vote. And she just walked out because <laughs> she couldn't, she couldn't do it. It wasn't the season, but as she's come out of that, I think what we're forgetting too is, you know, we're in a culture that wants to see how many YouTube followers do you have? How many people are you influencing? When in reality, if we just focused on our sphere, our 12, like Jesus did, um, you know, Lauren has has form, formed groups um, where they just get together for coffee and talk about one thing with other young moms who really aren't very politically motivated, don't even really care who's president, you know, that kind of thing, but making them see, but it actually does matter. Um, and it will matter for your children. So she's really focusing not on getting the likes on, on social media, which she does post, she does post things on there, but it is coming back and calling her friends mm -hmm. and saying, let's have a conversation. Let's talk about this. Yeah, something that I've always enjoyed doing, and y'all know that this happens, is I have a big house. And for usually half the year, if not more, I have a young person living upstairs. And, you know, generally for free. Because helping them one at a time, you actually help them. Right? And so how many of us, as we begin to empty nests, could be having a, you know, a service like that? And Because let me tell you, that's why I do it. It's just too lonely. I want to hear those voices. I don't want them to come down every night and talk to me, but I want to know that they could come down and, and talk to me. So, you know, so Lauren's on that track and Robert always has these, like, I don't even know where he finds these people who live in his basement. They're not in CC community. 
So just Christians being hospitable, I think is the first thing to showing folks that we can do this together. We don't have to ask the government to help these folks. Uh, several years ago, I came up with this notion that I'm not going to be the one that it can be on the national platform. Mm -hmm. um, Lee, you're one of those people that um, is, and you, you have the ability to do that. I'm going to be the one that is going to have her 12. And that's okay by me because we all need that. If we all just stayed focused on our current I hate to use the word village because of I know, who, connotation. It, who makes me think, yeah, the connotation of it. But, uh, you know, in, in all reality, it does take a village and it takes all of us working together, like-minded people working together. And as that small force gets larger and larger, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I left the trenches of California. I couldn't handle it any longer. I'm not from California, but I ended up there um 33 34 years ago and um actually 35 now uh and my kids were gutted uh, why are we leaving our home and i just told them i said i can't fight this but mm -hmm. what i am doing is i'm giving you the tools to fight it and if california means that much to you you will go back and you will be that warrior that hopefully can right the ship Mm -hmm. if it means that much to you, mm -hmm. but that that's just not where I'm at right now at my age. I mean, I'm knocking at my sixth decade here in a yeah. few months. So yeah, it, it's like, I'm at the tail end of this, but that's not to say that I wouldn't be in there for the good fight to support somebody else. I'm not just mm -hmm. like totally walking away from it. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you being on the book club. That helps me. Yeah. So, so Nicole, what do you see your church doing to kind of help? Is there any kind of um, free market kind of preaching, teaching, school or the, where, where you attend? Is, do you see them making the situation better or worse? Because because Kevin talked about, you know, it's got to be Christian education that's going to make this happen. I, well, we've only been members of our current church for not quite a year yet. Um, so I don't, I don't think I hear a lot, but I mean, of the people I've gotten to know and just conversations, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I'm not saying I have, like I said, we've only been there for a year and having a baby, I haven't been super involved in church lately. Mm -hmm. I kind of just show up right now, but I mean, as far as like, kind of where I do see some ideas is that one of our church, um, the director of the pregnancy center is at, um, goes to the church and um, there's those ideas of, you know, volunteerism. I'm saying, if I'm saying that right, um, of just teaching people that if as Christians, it's not the role of the civil government, because we did cover first, uh, Samuel eight, a few months ago, where, you know, people were saying, give us a King. And it's like, no, God's the King. Right. Um, and I think that's what a lot of Christians have fallen into is they're constantly looking for the civil government. To fix the problems like mm -hmm. i think i had mentioned this before we've got all these signs all over our community that say vote yes to the school bond mm -hmm. um and everything and you know there's a lot of people at my church that use the civil government schools i think there's one other homeschooler <laughs> besides ah. me. so you're a real missionary i am um and the other person there they do uh, CC also, but they uh, had joined another uh, community that's still in our in our area. Um, so I kind of hope that as I get to be really more involved in the church, once we get through the infant baby stage, that mm -hmm. I can have more of those conversations with people. So, but, so it sounds like your sounds like your pastor preaches well for Samuel. It sounds like the crisis pregnancy person has some influence, but then you've got these bond signs everywhere. So they still haven't quite figured out how to follow the money. Yeah, I think what, you know, when I think about like what Kevin's book is about mm -hmm. is, is that if the preachers aren't really preaching on these things and, and our preacher, his kids are in the civil government schools. 
Um, mm. So, you know, I think it's like, there's just so much, there's so much lack of education and ignorance mm. in that Christians are not taught the proper roles of our government. So anytime we thought of any kind of economic policy, we're like, yeah, that sounds good. Or, well, that sounds like a good way to love my neighbor instead of what specifically Romans 13 says to do. And I think that's why so much economic policy tends to fall flat is because it's not, it's not biblical. Mm. Yeah, I was speaking on you because you're our youngest one and I wanted to know what you were seeing. Go ahead, Michelle. I was going to say, I had to laugh several years ago because, um, well, first of all, my husband always says any bond issue just means that we're, it's a tax and I'm not paying more taxes. The other thing is, is that he would take the twins out when they were, you know, well, he still takes them out, but when they were five, six, seven, they, he'd be running them here and there. And he would see somebody along the street with a sign saying, hungry, please help. And in his very delicate way, he would say, that guy's a bum. All he's doing is trying to steal our money and he's not paying taxes on it. So a good friend of ours who's very left of center um, was walking the kids to Starbucks and there was somebody out panhandling. And my daughter looks at him and says, Uncle Paul, don't do that. That guy's a bum. He's just trying to steal your money and he doesn't pay taxes on it. <laughs> like... Okay, that's you probably do that a little bit better, but <laughs> it's kind of funny because then he comes home and he goes, I can't believe she said that. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was probably a surprise, but they're paying attention. Yeah. Yeah, they are paying attention. Yeah. So, and that's the problem. They're paying attention to a lot of bad doctrine, too. Yeah. Okay, well, let me read a little bit of this because we are supposed to be look, you know, looking at the book. I wanted to go to, I can find it in my booklet here, um, uh, The Broken Window Fallacy. And um, Nicole, would you mind to begin reading that? I'll read like, what you find? It's the first part of chapter two. The thing's only two pages oh. long. And for me, this is the number one thing I always remember about Hazlitt is this broken window. So whenever somebody's trying to tell me something's good about a government policy in my mind, I go to, okay, broken window. That's the first thing I think of. And I try to see what the analogy is to that. So Nicole. All right. How much of it do you want me to read? I don't know, for a minute. Okay. Just starting at the beginning? Yeah, with let us begin. All right, let us begin with the simplest illustration possible. Let us, emulating Bastiat, choose a broken pane of glass. A young hoodlum says he eaves a brick through the window of a baker's shop. The shopkeeper runs out furious, but the boy is gone. A crowd gathers and begins to stare with quiet satisfaction as the gaping hole in the window and the shattered glass over the bread and pies. After a while, the crowd feels the need for philosophic reflection, and several of its members are almost certain to remind each other or the baker that after all the misfortune misfortune has its bright side. Let me keep going. Sure. It will make business for some glazier. As they begin to think of this, they elaborate upon it. How much does a new plate, new plate glass window cost? $250? That will be quite a sum. After all, if windows were never broken, what would happen to the glass business? Then of course the thing is endless. The glazier will have 250 more to spend with other merchants, and these in turn will have 250 more to spend with still other merchants, and so ad infinitum. The smashed, win smashed window will go on providing money and employment in ever widening circles. The logical conclusion from all this would be if the crowd drew it, that the little hoodlum who threw the brick far from being a public menace was a public benefactor. You and Guan Michelle. Sure, now let us take another look. The crowd is at least right in its first conclusion. This little act of vandalism will be the first instance mean uh, will in the first instance mean more business for some glazier. The glazier will be no more unhappy to learn of the incident than an undertaker to learn of a death. But the shopkeeper will be out $250 that he was planning to spend for a new suit. Because he has had to replace the window, he will have to go without the suit or some equivalent need or luxury. Instead of having a window and $250, he now has merely a window. 
Or as he was planning to buy the suit that very afternoon, instead of having both the window and a suit, he must be content with the window and no suit. If we think of him as part of the community, the community has lost a new suit that might otherwise have come into being and is just that much poorer. The Glazier's gain of business, in short, is merely the tailor's loss of business. No new employment has been added. The people in the crowd were thinking only of two parties to the transaction, the baker and the Glazier. They had forgotten the potential third party involved, the tailor. They forgot him precisely because he will not enter the scene. They will see the new window in the next day or two. They will never see the extra suit precisely because it will never be made. They see only what is immediately visible to the eye. So Kevin, uh, take what we just read and um, uh, explain how it relates to what the one lesson is. Well, let's see. Putting you on the spot there. If people are looking at just the immediacy of the situation of thinking, oh, it'll be okay. Our community will still benefit from those dollars spent. That is missing the longer effect. And that is that the victim would have that money to spend on a want versus a need or even building the mm -hmm. business. So I think that would, um, and then I suppose in the second part of the lesson, tracing the consequences of that policy from one group or another. I don't know if that expressly applies, but obviously it's, it is shifting the, uh, it's, it's making the, the victim have to force to choose where they're spending their money. So, um, but I think it's just the short term effects of that and, and making someone pay for an, a need versus a want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, need versus want is really good. We should bring, let's talk about that more next week. Um, yeah, so I think when he talks about the group, replacing one group, but all groups, you could say one. And so, so the group to him in that example is a group of glaciers. Of course, it's just one. But that glass people will make money versus the sued people making money. So, Tim, do you want to add anything? We're almost done. Um, yeah, just quickly, I think, I mean, I think this is a great book to match with the theme of your book club. Um, you know, Hazlitt's, one of his main premises is that the good economist or the real economist is the one who looks at the whole and not just the parts or or the the full term, right? The immediate and the long-term consequences and not just one or the other. Um, but this broken glass, uh, a broken window, analogy uh, you know I remember just a few months ago seeing a, a news story about a uh, a business um, somewhere I think in Michigan or or somewhere in the upper Midwest that some vandals broke in and destroyed a bunch and they were underinsured or uninsured uh, and mm -hmm. the company didn't have the money it was a little local business didn't have the money to rebuild everything so it didn't just take money from what they would have spent on one thing and take it to another thing, but it destroyed their business entirely, which put people out of work and mm -hmm. cost tax base to the, to the local, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and the, uh, and the benefit of having local businesses that supply the needs of the local people. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just really, I think, short-sighted, you know, very, very narrow focus to think, mm -hmm. oh, this creates something when in reality, mm -hmm. destruction never creates. It's, uh, yeah. you know, it, it, again, to bring it back to Christianity, right? We know that evil is destructive. Destructive never produces good, except for when God uses it in his supernatural mm -hmm. ability to change what is evil into mm -hmm. something good. Yeah. yeah. I hear a lot of that when I, when I deal with victims where someone will say, well, insurance took care of it. And... <laughs> I mean, I'm a fan of insurance because I think that insurance is a biblical idea uh, where <laughs> us people sh voluntarily sharing their money and, and managing risk. But we ultimately do pay for that. So I think it was 2020 or 2021. There were all those riots 
that costs billions of dollars and that that costs us money indirectly so tim i think that's a good point where you know if you dig deeper and dig deeper you can't just let someone say well insurance pay for it not only is there a deductible where that comes out of pocket for the victim but um, ultimately it does result in higher premiums and people like to complain about their premiums so that they don't necessarily want to connect it to higher crime rates. Well, and just think what's going to happen in, uh, like in Florida, if, if they keep having hurricanes eventually, because the, the fraudulent bad run may be good intentions and the greedy insurance companies all go under whenever there's a hurricane because they can't pay the bills. So FEMA or the state comes in and pays it. Right. So it's a uh, it, following the money is just hard. People just don't see how to do it. And when you say FEMA or the state, you mean us, Lee. We yes, pay I for know. It. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, if I if I might make one quick point, the one thing I like to point out to people is that because they, you know, they see this whole voucher thing is like, oh, it's our money. But but one thing that needs to be pointed out to people is that you have the middleman and, and bureaucrats are, are going to pay themselves quite well. And oftentimes they get paid a lot better, especially in DC, which is like the richest area, I think, I, maybe even in the world, but richest area in the United States. And they're going to pay themselves quite well, probably better than the private sector. Mm -hmm. And that costs money too. Mm -hmm. That's true. You know, Let's we see. went through this this little um, story, the broken window. And what I started just now thought about is there would have been a time if a hoodlum did that in a village that the people would grab that kid by the scruff of his neck and take him to his parents. And the parents would come and say, Mr. Baker, I'm really sorry that my son did this. What can we do? to make amends. But now you, you look at things and people just let stuff happen and or they get their phone out and they're recording it for something. So, you know, we've that we've lost that side of our moral compass where we just look at it and go, oh, it's a broken window. Yeah. So Michelle, let me push back on that a little because I think it's a good conversation for next time too. Is um I totally agree with you. But I think I agree with you because I live in a rural community and I have the ability to know my neighbors. How does that work when you live in a city with six skyscrapers, each holding 10,000 people? There's no way to know who that kid belongs to. I know. Yeah, I know. I know. So there's so and I think that's why cities are liberal and, and rural areas are conservative. If my neighbor is making me irritated, I can either deal with it or I can live with it. But if I'm in a city and the neighbors are poisoning the water like we talked about last week, or they're making noise all the time, and I tried to change them, eventually I'm going to call the police. Yeah, yeah. And Tim's right. Anonymity is a huge problem. Huge. Mm -hmm. And yeah, coming from, uh, you know, a, a suburban uh, part of metropolitan Los Angeles, you just see it left and right. There, there is no just picking up the phone and calling the police. You mm -hmm. get this, press this number, press that number. Um, you know, it's just, it's endless. And give them masks um, to wear so we can't recognize what they are, yeah. who they are. Yeah, yeah and yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. Well, I'm glad to have you guys think through these things with me. <laughs> and uh, maybe we'll stumble on something that works but I think thanks, Julie, for saying classical conversation is one of those things. And Kevin, thank you for standing up for the prosecution that uh, that you do and for Nicole at your church and Michelle for telling your kids what you did and Tim for just really thinking clearly about so many things. So I, I really believe we're making a difference. So, Kevin, you want to end in prayer and we'll be done? Yeah, let, let's do that. Leah, I thank you. Um... Lord, for bringing us all together. We're just uh, in the right place at the right time. And we know that because you have brought us here. So we, Lord, we do pray for the millions and millions of people in our country that are Christian and that are trying to just saw the wood in front of them and, and deal with the people immediately around them, like their neighbors and be a, a lasting influence over the years. And Lord, we have faith 
in you that you're going to bring a revival, not just to uh, local areas, but to our country and our nation. And we do pray for all the people that have not seen uh, your son as their personal savior. So we pray for them. And then we pray that they can begin to think like Christians so that we can uh, live in a society that is ultimately a great witness advancing your kingdom. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. All right. So everyone come up with an example next week to talk about how a policy doesn't really see the other groups. And some some con- okay. some current examples. Okay. okay. Um okay. real quick before you go, Julie and Lee, we're not going to be meeting on the fourth of May, correct? We well, will not. Exactly. Well, so because, well, here, Kevin's not necessarily coming to the conference, and I'm available that evening, right? I'm not speaking at that time. I think I can be on, actually. So um, are okay. you going to be in town, Michelle? Yeah, I will be in town. So I'm going to be at a campground, and I they do have Wi-Fi there, so I can hop on there. Well, how about you, Tim and, and Nicole? Are any of you coming to the conference? I will be at Lisa Bailey's house that night, but we may be uh, collaborating on your other book club that evening. I'm not sure since. Uh, yes. So we're going to have mm. you and Lisa be in charge of words out spoken, but I think I'm on. I don't think I have to speak at the conference that night. And then I could be on at eight o'clock. So I don't see any reason to cancel this one. Kevin, it might be just me and you. Yeah, <laughs> I may not be you. on. Well, I may not be on. I'll be with grads <laughs> okay. Thursday night, but. Um, we have, well, our, I, we have our pregnancy center fundraiser on May 4th. So I'm going yeah. to that. Instead. Yeah. So I'm, I will still host them. I will, I don't like canceling things because you never know that one person who might show up. We had that today at mm-hmm. our DeFi, at our Bitcoin meeting. I was going to cancel it. And this man who nobody knew came and I was so glad we were there. So a few more people pulled in and we had a little meeting real quick because, you know, we okay. do advertise we're doing this. So I plan to be there at, um, but it'd be great, Tim, if you and Lisa could at least be in charge of that one because I'll be so busy that day. So, no, Lee, no uh, really quick, I could, I think Ray Moore was going to join us next month. I can see if maybe he'd be willing to come on. And that way, if we have to, we can ask him, you know, right. some questions. I guess that would, you know what, I'm thinking a week to, oh yeah, that is May 4th. So that would be the Blumenfeld. So th- that's an option. Yeah. The other one is I was with Charles Moskowitz today on interviewing and um, Charles Moskowitz was uh, uh, Samuel Blumenfeld's like partner in crime. So he would probably be willing to come on too. So we we could get some guest people if we need to. Um, So otherwise, I'm pretty sure I'm on and we can just keep reading. Because what will we be reading that week or month? We're reading, we're reading Blumenfeld's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, it's pretty good. It'll get us fired up, and I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Just if you aren't familiar with him, Blumenfeld's the guy that actually re- re-brought phonics back and like was just destroying whole language and said, no, we've got to go back to phonics. So that's what he's famous for, as well as he wrote the book called Is Public Education Necessary, which I find so ironic because he was a public school teacher. So I don't know if he learned mm-hmm. his lesson or what. I would like to find that out. I, I, I wonder if he would be in favor of vouchers, but <laughs> yeah. I guess we'll never know. Could be. Could be. Oh. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, guys. Okay, bye. Bye, everyone.